Good evening. You know, I enjoyed the lesson very much this morning. I could tell Chris put a lot of work into it. And uh, like a good wife, his wife made sure he stayed on track, I'm sure. So I had a few warnings about mine today, too, or yesterday, actually. She's lining me up for tonight. So uh, she's always my greatest fan and my greatest critic. So whatever I do wrong, I'm going to hear about it. And I appreciate Matt reading those verses. We're going to be talking about purity tonight. And Psalms 51 is a great place to read a little bit about purity, but we're actually not going to be looking at Psalms 51. You know, when you think about purity, is it important? Is it something we need to be concerned about? Well, you know, does it really matter or should it matter to me? Or is it just another one of those things that's, you know, it's a good thing, but, you know, it's not really necessary. Well, in Matthew 5 and verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, I don't know about you, but me, I'd like to see God. Not as an angry God, but as a loving God. So, purity is kind of important. It states it right there. The Lord said, hey, it matters. But then we need to know what purity really is. You know, society has some weird ideas about what purity is. We're not interested in society's ideas about purity. We're only interested in what God and our Savior thinks about purity. But you know, the definition, it starts out if you read any dictionary or look it up online, it says it's unmixed with any other matter, it's free from taint. So you, have, you know, we see these advertisements for pure water, pure this, pure ivory soap, if you're an old person like me and can remember that far back. But you know, tonight what we're really talking about, purity, we're talking about being free from moral are un, uh, free from moral defilement, without spot, not sullied or tarnished, incorrupt, unbiased, un, undebased by moral turpitude and holy. And, you know, sound like a really good definition. I understood all those words except for the next to the last one. So I looked it up to see exactly what that really meant. And it's talking about being a moral person. But what I found interesting was our society is changing so much that moral turpitude is in the law. It talked about a lot of things that were unacceptable behavior by people in society. But a few years back, Canada kind of changed or incorporated in their law that it's something that's not accepted by the majority of the people in a, in a society or a group. So if our group or society gets together and decides some sin is okay, then that's not falls under this anymore. That's our opinion that what is okay, but we're Christians. It doesn't really matter what you or I think, it's what does the Lord think. And it's talking about purity of heart is extremely desirable. You know, the Bible refers to the heart, which is not talking about this pomp, although that's usually where we, we point to when we're talking about our feelings. It appears 830 times in the Bible. It's a word that you can find all through the Old and New Testament. It part, and it's in its plural form 113 times. If you go back and look at the Hebrew word, it refers to the center or middle of something. It's the heart of the matter. It's, it's that, you know, we talk about getting to the heart of the matter. We're, that's that Hebrew word we're referring to. The Greek word is a little better word. It's cardia. It points to the innermost part of something. It's the innermost part of myself. It's that deep down inside me that makes me what I am. It's a place where I have real commitments. That's where it defines who and what I am. And it is part of me that is continually under the scrutiny and searching eyes of the Lord. And how do I know that? In 2 Chronicles, it tells us the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. Not only do I have to be pure to see the Lord, if I want his help, I need to be pure. That's what it says. The Lord's constantly searching for the purity in the world for those that he can help, his people. And this is something that should give us great, uh, you know, should make us feel really good. We're going through a hard time and we're serving the Lord and we're being pure in heart and mind. We know the Lord sees and he's helping us. Maybe he's not helping me, Andrew, the way Andrew would really like but he's helping me get through that difficult time. 
The heart is the source of our conflict and struggles also. You know, more often than not, that's what we really think about, or at least that's often what I think about. And I think most people, you know, in Genesis, the Lord said he saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of his thoughts of his heart was evil continually. And when I live in this society, I kind of feel that way. Of course, if I read about the Roman society, I can see it was the same way back then. Man has this tendency to sit in his mind and think of more evil. And we live in a society where that is so easy. You can go on the Internet, Facebook, wherever. You can find stuff you have no business viewing that helps corrupt your mind and lead you away from purity. It helps you constantly think on evil things. To live in fantasy worlds. You get all these games out there you know you can be involved in. Not only the violence, but sexual. Just anything you want that's immoral and incorruptible, you can get involved in. And you shouldn't. You have to draw the line somewhere. He also, Matthew 15, 19, he says, For out of the heart comes the evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are the things which defile a person. He says the things that we do that defile us, they start in our heart. It doesn't mean that any of us are never going to have any evil thoughts. It's just that when we dwell on them, they become more acceptable. When we read about things, and, you know, we just look at our society. We look at what's on TV, what's acceptable now. It's moral turpitude, you know. It's just really bad. But our society's accepted it, and the more we see it, the more we don't really notice it so much. You know? And that's wrong. Because out of those thoughts are things that lead us to do things that are wrong. You know, a man or a woman doesn't get up one morning and say, today's the day I'm going to commit adultery. I've decided today's it. It starts with the thought, my wife's mad at me or my husband's mad at me and somebody does something nice to me and all of a sudden I start comparing the person I live with with someone else. Or the wife of my youth doesn't look like she did when she was youthful. And I notice the neighbor's wife, she looks more like my wife did when she was youthful. And before long, you're thinking in your mind how nice it would be to do something. And then if you're not careful, you act on it. That's what causes adultery. It starts in the heart, it comes out. When you're young, you're exposed to a lot of things. When you're old, you're exposed to a lot of things. You have to decide what you're gonna think of. You have to think about what it takes not to do that. You have to ask the Lord's help because those things are what lead us to act in ways that defile us. My heart can corrupt me. It's obvious from these two verses that my heart can be my major problem. So I need, to, I need to train it. I need to help. But it can also be a, a source of my purity when I yield it to God. When I concentrate on God's word, when I study that, when I pray for his help, my mind can help me make the pure decision, not the impure decision. It's kind of like being addicted to something. After you finally realize you've got a problem, you've got to retrain your mind. You've got to decide that I'm not going to make that decision again. And it takes help. And that's what we're all here for. We're to help each other in dealing with these moral issues. So what is purity? It's being free from guilt. It's being guiltless. It's being innocent. You know, a child is innocent, right? And then they grow up and they start, they become two years old and they start making all these really bad decisions, right? And from then on, it just gets worse. They turn into teenagers and they make these really crazy decisions. And some of them become adults and make worse decisions. But you know, innocence is what we're after. That's what real purity is all about. It's free from vice or moral turpitude. It's kind of like an elder. You know, in Titus 1, 6 through 9, it talks about some of the qualities of an elder in a man that's looking to be an elder. It says, he's not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. 
you know, the man that's going to be an elder, he's dealt with these moral issues and he's grown. He's determined he's not going to commit these things. And it says, you know, when you're looking for a man to serve in that, that position, that's the kind you want. One that's morally pure. One that doesn't have to deal with these issues. Not someone that's struggling with those issues, but somebody that has conquered those with the help of the Lord. You need to have pure speech. In Ephesians 4.29, it says, Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is such as is good for the building up as fits the occasion, that it may be give grace to those who hear, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. It says, don't let corrupt speech come out. Now, some of that's pretty easy. You know, uh, I worked in a refinery once, and I got a bad habit of lose, using uh, unfit language. And it took a little while to break myself of that when I quit working there, and I decided I want to be that kind of person. And, and so I don't really have a problem with cuss words. But, you know, it has this little thing right in here that says, only such is good for building up. And something I have to watch myself for is at work sometimes they'll be, they'll, some, somebody will say something about some other employee and if I'm not careful, I'll agree with them. And they might be true, but is that really building up? Or I'm just gossiping, you know. Am I really going out of my way to say something in a situation to build somebody up? Or is really what I'm saying tearing somebody down? Is it corrupt speech? We don't really think about it that way, do we? Most of us can say, yeah, we understand you shouldn't cuss. But when you think about how we say things about other people, are we building the other people up, our co-workers, anybody? We need to think about these things because it's part of being pure. In Romans, it says, let us walk honestly as in the day, not in writing or drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. You know, we control ourselves. We don't go out after work with the co-workers and get involved in things we shouldn't be involved in. Or with our young friends in college or high school. You know, it's easy to go out with a bunch of people with all the good intentions of having a good time, and then things happen. We need to think about what we're getting ourselves involved in. As adults, we get involved in social activities that seem pretty okay. You know, they're fundraisers, they're good things for the community. But we have to think about, you know, what am I going to do if a situation comes up? Sometimes these social activities require us to give a lot of our time or maybe our resources. We feel obligated to do that. Does it interfere with my time that I should be serving the Lord, attending services? Does it interfere with my ability to give back to the Lord? We need to be careful what we get involved in. Sometimes social activities, you're around people that certainly don't have your moral standards. Are they going to be an influence on you? Or are you going to be an influence on them? Things that seem so innocent in service sometimes really aren't. They can lead to our impurity. 1 Peter 1, says, See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. It's a commandment to love each other fervently. But it says to do it with a pure heart. That means I need to be pure. I need to work on that purity. It's important. It's part of what helps me love you that way. In 1 Peter 2 and 11, it says, sustain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. It says, avoid those things that cause you trouble. Sometimes you don't know they're going to cause you trouble to get involved in them. But when you find yourself in that situation, you need to run in the other direction. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, So flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. You want to be that young man that grows up to be an elder? Or that young woman that grows up and her husband becomes an elder? You've got to flee these youthful lusts. But it says one of the ways you do that it says, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. It's each of us helping each other to have a pure heart. To grow past our 
sinful natures. Doesn't mean we're ever going to quit sinning, but we should grow and mature to where it's easier to do what's right. So how do I get purity? Well, in Isaiah 1.18, it says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. You know, the Lord says, he looks at our sin, it's like me taking a piece of a wool or cotton and dip it in blood, and it's crimson. And you know, I can wash it, I can soak that wool in the water or my white shirt, and it gets most of it out. But if I look really close, a lot of times I still see that little tinge. It's not quite there. You know, it's not quite pure anymore. But the Lord says with him, he's able to wipe away that sin. He's able to make us pure, as Matt read in Psalms 51. And you know, it takes baptism. We, we as Christians and worshipers here, most of us, you know, we already understand that, washing, that when we get baptized, it washes away our sins. We become pure. It takes a sinful man, and the Lord's blood cleanses us whiter than snow. And that's a great comfort. But what happens after that? And we start out white. We're like that little baby we bring home. It's pure. It's innocent. And then we're dealing with that teenager. Then we don't know what happened. You know? So once you're baptized, is that all there is to it? You're not ever going to have any more problems? No temptations? No moral issues? No, we know that's not it. It says a pure heart is the wellspring of Christian actions. Just think about how important it is. You know, you start out, you become a Christian, your heart's pure, you need to work on it because very important things happen. It says Christ, Christ dwells in our heart. In Ephesians 3.17, he tells us this. You, know, you think he's going to dwell in a messy, black, dirty, red, stained house? He wants your heart to be pure so he can dwell in you. You know, we, we read in Ephesians 5.19, we make melody in our heart. He wants our heart pure when we're singing to him and singing to each other and encouraging each other. You know, we must worship with the heart. The Lord tells us that's important. It's not lip service. It's not me getting my box checked off. Andrew is here Sunday a.m., Sunday p.m., and Wednesday. He made a good week this week. That's not what it's all about. I have to worship from the heart. We must forgive from the heart. You know, it's not enough for me just to say, somebody says, you know, did me wrong, says, hey, uh, I want you to forgive me. And I say, okay, I, do, I know that's, uh, yeah, okay. And I expect tomorrow you'll do exactly the same thing to me. I, will, I need to forgive like the Lord. Forgive and forget. Often we can forgive at the moment. We have a hard time staying in that mindset about someone else. We must give with purpose of heart. When we give back to the Lord, we're supposed to have already purposed in our heart. A pure heart makes that a lot easier. You know, it's not me saying, okay, I'll just uh, placate my family and I'll give a little bit, but I'm really not doing it because that's what I want to do. You know, it should be I'm glad to give back, and I understand that what I have belongs to the Lord. I'm happy to do that. I've purposed that, hey, this much out of today, this week's paycheck is going back to that. We need to call out to the Lord of the pure heart. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You know, Paul's writing to Timothy. He's writing to Christians. People are already supposed to have a pure heart. What does he call us? Double-minded. Why does he do that? Because we want to serve God. We also kind of want to have it our own way a lot of times. He says, purify your hearts. When you worship God, come prepared. I've already worked on purifying your mind. Our love must come out of a pure heart, as Matthew 22, 37 says. This is important. 1 Timothy 1, 
verse 5, it says, The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. We're supposed to be a loving, kind people. The only way we can do that is we have pure hearts. We can't let society's ideas of moral purity become our standards because they're wrong. The Lord tells us what our moral purity is supposed to be. We're supposed to love others. We're supposed to care enough about someone else that we would take time to talk to them if we have the opportunity so they'll become saved. We're concerned like the Lord Jesus about lost souls. But it takes a pure heart to do that. And you know, it's easy to let things interfere. To allow things creep in our hearts and minds, our worries. Some of us are great at boxing our worries up, others aren't. But you know what? We all need to concentrate on the right things. We need to have that moral purity. So how do I return to purity when I've had a problem, when I realize that I'm not as pure as I need to be? We need to repent and pray. In Luke 11, verses 1 through 4, it says, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom has come. Give us, each day, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us for our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and leads us not into temptation. You know, the, the followers of Christ said, you know, Lord, you really need to help teach us how to pray. Like John taught his disciples. So he says, okay, I will. And he says, you know, he doesn't say, ask for forgiveness when you realize you sin. He says, approach your father and say, forgive us our sins. He knows we're going to fall. We're going to have those double-minded thoughts. He knows we're going to struggle every day. He says, do that. And then, by the way, remind yourself that you're asking the Lord to forgive you and you need to be working on forgiving others. Those people that do you wrong. The people that say or do things that frustrate you, you need to forgive them. You know, it's not enough to hope and wait someone comes and asks for your forgiveness. We need to forgive people because we want the Lord to forgive us. So it's important to pray about it. In Acts 8, 21 and 22, Simon the sorcerer, you know, he started out good. He heard the word. He obeyed the gospel. He watched the Peter come and perform miracles, and he was really impressed with it because he knew about trickery and sleight of hands. And he saw Peter passing on some of the gifts with the laying on of hands, and he thought, great way to earn a living. I need that. Well, he had the wrong attitude. And Peter told him, hey, your mind's in the wrong place. He says, you have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. He said, repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart might be forgiven you. And, you know, it worked because Simon said, I need you to pray for me. Sometimes we have problems. We just praying by ourselves isn't enough. We need other people to pray for us. Sometimes we need to make our problems known to the whole congregations. Sometimes just to the elders. You know, the elders are here to help us. If I'm struggling with a problem, they're great men to let them know I'm struggling. And if they can't help me, they probably know somebody in this congregation that can. Whatever my problem is, whatever my issue is, Somebody in this congregation has experienced that and has worked to overcome it or has continues to work to overcome it. You know, we're not, each of us, independent of, of everybody else. We don't have to do it all by ourselves. Now, men are kind of raised that way, so they have to work on that real hard. But you know what? We're all here for each other. We have to be willing to let other people help us stand up and we have to be able to help them stand up. You know, if we all stand up close enough, can you fall over? If you're surrounded by other people trying to help you stand, you can't fall because they're helping you carry the load. That's what we have to do for each other. That's what a pure heart does. It makes me more concerned about you and not just about me. 
Yes, I'm concerned about myself and going to heaven. And I know that I am. I have faith in God. But I also know, like Paul says, it's a struggle every day. I don't get up any day and make it through the day without realizing I could have done better for the Lord. I wish I could. I wish I could honestly get up and when I go to bed at night say, man, this is a great day. I did everything the Lord wanted. I got nothing wrong. That'd be a great feeling, but it ain't going to happen because I struggle just like everybody else. I struggle differently now than I did when I was 20 years old, but I still struggle. And you know, it's a lot easier now than it was when I was 20 years old. But I live in a much worse society. So in some ways, it's much harder. Like I said, you know, you're surrounded by people at work. Most of us don't work with other Christians, or maybe one or two. I was fortunate for a while to do that, this job I have. And, uh, and some of the other people I work with are pretty good, and some of them are flat out problematic. And they're not interested in what I have to say about the Lord, but that's okay. They still know about it. That's all I'm supposed to do. But you know, sometimes people just have real problems in their lives and they're not the least bit interested in changing it. But we are. We have problems in our lives and we're interested in getting rid of the problems so we'll be pure before God. So, you know, we need to think about this and ask ourselves, am I pure? Are you pure? You know, if you're not, we already talked about what's needed. First, you've got to be a Christian. If you haven't obeyed the gospel and been, had your sins washed away, you don't have any way to be pure. If you have, you let a little stain come back into your life, we're here to help pray for that. We're here to help you. If you have any need, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.